The average life expectancy of a shrew is about a year. Captive iguanas, several dozen. Humans, around 73 years as of a 2021 study. True elder species like Aldabra tortoises and Greenland sharks can live nearly 200 to potentially 500 years respectively. Growth rates also vary wildly among modern vertebrates, with small rodents reaching sexual maturity within months or weeks after birth, and the aforementioned Greenland shark not being able to reproduce until it's 150 years old. Dinosaurs were an incredibly diverse group even discounting the thousands of bird species nested within theropoda, and they utilized a variety of growth mechanisms and life history strategies that changed according to the animal's niche. But how do we tell how quickly an animal grew, or how old it was when it died? Let's find out. This is where we use histology, or the subfield of biology concerned with studying tissue. Most vertebrates leave growth rings, called lines of arrested growth or lags, inside their bones to mark periods when they pause growth, giving us an idea of how old they might be. You can look at weight-bearing bones, like limb bones, or non-weight-bearing bones, like ribs. Colin et al. 2020 summarizes the differences in this paragraph. Arguments favoring the use of weight-bearing bones rely on their more symmetrical growth, because they support the whole body mass and are thus less influenced by differential allometric patterns than non-weight-bearing bones. The counter-argument in favor of using non-weight-bearing bones is that they are less likely to experience stress-induced microfractures and consequently less likely to be remodeled. As an additional benefit, they may have more complete growth records resulting from a lack of large medullary cavities. The study ultimately found that weight-bearing bones were better to use for theropods since they experienced less remodeling, while non-weight-bearing bones were typically a better record for sauropod growth. Tissue remodeling is when existing tissue, in this case bone, is renovated by the body, and can be caused by either trauma or continued growth. A broken bone that heals is an example of remodeling, since the bone needs to knit itself back together. When an animal is very old, the edge of its growth rings in its bones can also experience remodeling, since its actual size doesn't really increase further past a certain age. The growth lines overlap without further room to go, making further analysis essentially impossible. Another important term for us to know is EFS, or the External Fundamental System, defined by Calderon 2023 as a band of slow-growing tissue deposited in the periphery of the bone cortex of some tetrapod limb bones as a result of low bone growth rates. This structure has been commonly used as an indicator of maturity attainment, allowing researchers to infer life history traits, example given age of maturity growth rates, in both fossil and extant taxa. If an individual skeleton displays an EFS, it's typically considered to be skeletally mature and to not have major body size increases left, although the shape of the skeleton can still change. You can see how histology is pretty much the only way to determine skeletal maturity. Basing a maturation assessment on size alone can be messy. Look at Platyosaurus Englehardi, the poster child for developmental plasticity in dinosaurs. Fully grown adults with an EFS present can range from 4.8 meters and 476 kilograms to 10 meters and 4,300 kilograms, a difference of over 600%. That's far from typical for dinosaurs, but you get the point. Histo's the way to go. Man, maybe I should put that on a t-shirt. There appear to be three primary growth strategies in large body dinosaurs. Heterochrony, where growth rates change according to the life stage of the animal. Hypermorphosis, where the animal experiences extended growth throughout most of its life. And indeterminate growth, where growth is irregular and mainly determined by outside resources instead of internal regulation. It's worth mentioning that pretty much every animal experiences some degree of indeterminate growth in addition to their primary strategy, but it can be the main form of growth for some taxa. Big tyrannosaurs are typical heterochronic growers, taking the rapid growth strategy during their teen years to the extreme. Some large thyreophorans like Kentrosaurus also fit into this category, growing quickly throughout young years and then slowing down at sexual maturity and then again at somatic maturity. Although Kentrosaurus also demonstrated variance depending on the season, so there is definite overlap between these strategies. Hadrosaurids are also extremely heterochronic, with a 2018 study establishing that species like Myasaura grew as proportionally quickly as birds packing on over 800 kilograms a year during the first few years of their life, then slowing down to near negligible growth by the time they were 7 to 9 years old. On the theropod side, Cullen et al. 2020 suggested that the higher metabolisms and growth rates of coelurosaurs may have been a key factor in how rapidly the biggest tyrannosaurs were able to develop massive body sizes in Cretaceous North America after the allosauroids disappeared. 
From their early to late teens, they went from the Slim Katana build to the Witch King's Morning Star build, packing on thousands of kilograms in a short time frame and then slowing down to a crawl in their early 20s. They're the ones that partied hard. They drank, fought, and made their ancestors proud, suffering brutal injuries throughout their relatively short lives. Sue and Trix are two of the oldest Tyrannosaurus specimens at 28 and 30 years old respectively, and are on the larger side as well. Scotty, despite being a relative youngster in its early 20s, was bigger than either of them. Interestingly, Woodward et al. 2020 examined Jane and another juvenile Tyrannosaurus, showing that they were 13 and 15 years old respectively, and their growth up to that point had been heavily influenced by resource availability. I reached out to Dr. Woodward for this video, and she clarified that the two specimens were just about to enter the massive growth spurt. Heterochrony and hypermorphosis likely never existed in a vacuum. The biggest Tyrannosaurus specimen, E.D. Cope or BHI 6248, was between 30 and 32 years old, according to an analysis done by Victor Porter at the Indianapolis Children's Museum. Keep an eye out for more regarding this specimen. A lot more information should go public within the next year or so, including scans of the bones. Turns out the gap between Cope and the rest of the Rex pack was a big one, and there's a lot more complete material than we thought, including the largest theropod dorsal ever measured. I recently spoke with Scott Hartman and Eric Snively about the specimen, and even just based on the enormous maxilla and appendicular material, they agreed that a range of 11.5 to nearly 12 tons was reasonable scaling from Sue and Scotty. Although once those giant vert measurements are public, we'll have a much better idea of Cope's overall size. In the middle of the road, at least some ornithopods experienced the indeterminate growth method, where their lags were internally inconsistent and growth mainly depended on how much they were eating. This is observed in Dicelotosaurus from Tanzania, and is apparently a common trend in smaller ornithopods. Hubner 2012 states that smaller ornithopods often lack regularly developed annuli lags due to lower food demands, no need for migration, and precocial behavior. But, of course, all dinosaurs would have experienced indeterminate growth to some degree. Some were just more specially unspecialized. Representing the consistent and slow extreme, hypermorphosis, are big thyreophorans, most sauropods, and other large theropods. Sauropods typically grow at a near-constant rapid rate when young, and only begin to deposit lines of arrested growth when they approach skeletal maturity, so it represents more of a straight line of mass gain for a large portion of their life. Carcharodontosaurids and spinosaurids, while peaking in the same 8 plus ton weight class as the biggest tyrannosaurs, reached their size slowly and steadily. The Meraxes holotype was estimated to reach skeletal maturity between 35 and 49 years old and may have lived as long as 53 years, reaching a little over 5 tons. Stegosaurus grew slowly as well, and as mentioned earlier, Kentrosaurus experienced a switch from rapid to slow growth, so it doesn't seem like we can phylogenetically characterize a lot of ornithischians in terms of their growth strategies it may be a case-by-case -case basis. Griebeler et al. 2013 found that Platyosaurus Engelhardi reached maturity at 16.4 years, while the larger sauropods reached maturity, defined by their team as 90% of asymptotic size, in their early to mid-20s, and were between 35 and 45 years old at time of death. The oldest of the batch was an indeterminate mementosaur that died at around 45. That was the record holder for sauropods until very recently. Woodruff et al. 2024, a team that included my friend Brian Curtis, just published a histological analysis of Diplodocus halorum, previously Seismosaurus, and Supersaurus vivianae. They found the 30 plus meter Diplodocus specimen to be about 60 years old at time of death, breaking the previous record by 15 years, and no EFS was observed, indicating that although it was skeletally mature, some minor growth remained. Then there's the 35 meter Supersaurus Jimbo, which did demonstrate an EFS that implied a cessation of meaningful growth. It was so far past the point of skeletal maturity, in fact, that the team's retro calculation software couldn't handle it and spout out an age of 225 years at time of death. They are very clear that this is not a serious proposition for the age of the animal, but it does show that the Supersaurus specimen was skeletal mature and quite elderly. Whether or not it was older than the Diplodocus is a question that may be answered by further research. Go check out Brian's channel Fossil Crates for a more in-depth analysis of their study and make sure to subscribe for his awesome paleo updates. You may have noticed the lack of ceratopsians up to this point in the video. Here's the side note. They're messy, often lack postcrania, and their histology is very poorly understood. From the handful of taxa that have had their postcrania analyzed, we've been able to tell that derived chasmosaurians follow the hypermorphic trend of consistent growth throughout life, whilst intrasaurians are closer to heterochrony where they grew rapidly at first and then slowed down to a crawl. 
Basal ceratopsians like Psittacosaurus may have been developmentally plastic, like how Platiosaurus was for sauropodomorphs, but I stress again that we know next to nothing about the growth strategies for this particular dinosaur group. Thank you for joining me on this journey, and shoutouts to Stigo and Table Seating for helping me find obscure ornithischian papers. I originally meant to just talk about the Diplodocus and Supersaurus study, but I got pulled down the rabbit hole and couldn't say no to learning more about dinosaur life histories in general. If you'd like to see more analyses like this, please subscribe and let me know in the comments below. I've really enjoyed making lecture type videos like this one and the prehistoric trauma video, which I do still plan on making a follow up to. If you're watching this in the future, check out the link, and the sources for this video are in the pinned comment. Join the channel for special perks which include early access to videos at the Megatherapod tier and above. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.